Good morning, Erin. Good morning, Nicole. And welcome to Hands On Workshop's um, first interview with one of our makers. But uh, in your case, you're a maker, a maker mender, um, which is an interesting little space to arrive at. So perhaps you can tell me about your your journey and how you became the the modern mender. Mm, good question. Um, I, w- I wish I, I had a snappy answer for you. Um, I think the main thing is that I've always made stuff, always. And ever since I was a little kid and before I even realized I was a maker, it's funny going back to like my um, school yearbooks and also going to like my high school reunion and talking to friends who knew me way back when. And that's the thing they remember about me, whereas I don't really remember that at all. Um, but I think, I think the mender part that has just, um, it's something that I've only realized later, even though I've been doing that forever too. And I think the difference is if you could say it, sum it up in a nutshell is that my preference is always to make things from things that already exist rather than buying new. Right. So starting, starting from looking at what do I already have? And that doesn't mean using nothing new or making nothing new. Like um, I'm going to be sewing a couple projects over the next few months, but it just means taking that step back and not always creating new things and going, what can we make from the stuff that's already here? Or what can we fix that we already have to make better and keep it going as long as possible? Do you think that is also a product of the time at which you started where it, um, as you said, you were interested in it from um, when you were a young girl, that you were just using things around the house because you were too young to go off to a shop by yourself? I think I've always found stuff, and particularly old stuff, very interesting. So in, in terms of source materials, I've always been very interested in things from op shops, um, even things that are in like the recycling bin, Or like one of my favorite materials is the inside of security envelopes. um, Sorry, refresh my memory. What's a security envelope? uh, You know, the the envelopes that have like beautiful patterns on the inside. So they disguise your like financial information or whatever a bank needs to send you or utility bills. So when you open up an envelope that comes from a business, have a look at the pattern on the paper on the inside. So on the outside, it's white. On the inside, it's usually blue, sometimes black or purple. And they've got all sorts of beautiful patterns on them that are just fantastic to use for paper crafts and things. I find them very inspiring. Oh, okay, okay. It's a thing. It's even got a hashtag as well. So you can see security envelope art, I think, on Instagram. I I have learned something. I had no idea there was a reason for all of that that was for, you know, a security feature. Yes. And so um, what were some of the first things that you remit that have stayed in your memory about sort of your first projects that really excited you and helped you continue along that path? Uh, When I was in school, I was doing a lot of sewing. So I I made quite a few outfits that make me laugh now when I look back at the photographs. I was that person who was always making things out of inappropriate fabrics (laughs) because I wanted For me, I think sewing was about making what I wanted and making something unique that didn't exist. And so if I couldn't find something in the shops that I really loved, that I could make something that was more like what I had in mind. And also, I didn't always know what that was and I didn't always get there, but I was always trying to make something that was very unique and like what I thought was going to be good, but it wasn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily choose the right fabrics for the job. But So can you give me some examples? Um, I made a pair of overalls or some people might call them dungarees oh, yes, um, yeah. out of rayon. That was that was not suitable. Oh, um, right, yes. <laughs> and also made a dress that was meant to be made out of like a lightweight material and made it out of velvet. Oh right. And just just going, no, I see that fabric in the shop. I want that fabric. Yeah. And I want that style. And just yeah. picking a pattern out of the pattern books and going, yes, I'm just gonna make it happen. Like I'm very um I'm very stubborn and right. very determined. And when I get an idea. I can't let it go. And that's kind of, that's how my brain works too. Usually I see a finished product 
in my mind and I think, oh, now I have to make that. And sometimes it's very frustrating. Sometimes I go, oh man, like I really don't want to spend the next three hours or 30 hours having to do that, but then I can't get it out of my mind unless I do it. Right. So it's, and you, it's part you, fun and part compulsion sometimes, depending to, to, on what the project is. Well, at least you complete projects, so that's a good thing. <laughs> um, but I, I guess, yes, also at a young age, that's about sort of your individual expression, which, which is a great thing. But I imagine also part of that making journey is um, when you did maybe make the wrong selections, that is that is part of the learning process. So that, I'm sure that would have helped. Definitely. And every single thing that I've done has has taught me at least one thing that then I can then use for the next project. Like I'll give you an example. I used to make um, light switch covers and I made one. I remember it was you mean like the, the, the panels that attach to light switches. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I made one that was covered in glitter and it was like pure glitter and I sealed it with Mod Podge and I didn't oh. even know if that was a thing that you could do. But I tried it and it worked. And so then I was able to apply that knowledge to future projects and go, oh, I know what happens if you use Mod Podge for this. Or, yes. you know, so just um, even if they didn't seem like huge projects at the time, every little thing was teaching me something that I could then apply. And I think that's definitely applied to my mending practice as well, because every mend that I do teaches me something. And then that makes it easier for me to to do something even better the next time or more complex because I've got all those basic building blocks that I've already tested and tried out. Right. Okay. So did you learn the, um, uh, the, I guess the traditional techniques for mending? I I'm, I'm learned thinking how to of things sew. like patching, darning, no things like that. I'm, I'm not really a mender. I'm a bit of a rough mender, but I don't do, I don't do a very good job on things that need sort of, serious work so I, I sort of sometimes botch it up or but it needs to be something to. that's really sort of it's an obvious mend and you kind of have to turn it into a bit of a feature but sorry getting back to um yes did you learn sort of the those traditional techniques when you were growing up no so I learned how to sew garments I was I was making my clothes pretty much from the start. I didn't I didn't go through the cushion cover and tote bag stage. Oh, okay. I just skipped straight to like making prom dresses. Oh, right. um, from, from <laughs> so I was like I was straight in. Um, and so for me, mending was about remaking clothes when they fell apart. So for me, like the earliest mends that I would do would be you know to replace a button or um, to to fix like a seam. So if a seam had come undone and some of the stitches had come loose, I would just restitch them on. And that's part of the, um, that went back so far, like so early into my childhood that I don't even remember when I started doing that. So that's why I can't tell people like, oh, this is when I started mending because I've just always done it. Yeah. Um, I didn't learn how to darn until I saw a tutorial on the internet, probably about 10 years ago. Okay. And is darning difficult? Darning. I should say, does it require a lot of um, practice and following a, a particular technique? There are multiple ways to darn. I can think of at least 10 different ways to darn, like different techniques. So there's not, there's not one way to do it. There are multiple types. Um, I think darning is the single most important mending skill anyone can learn. It's magical and it can work on knit fabric and woven fabric. So it's like the most useful thing you could ever do, but it's also quite daunting for people. And I think, I think the reason it's so daunting for people is not because it's hard in and of itself, but because it's so different to what people have done previously, that it's kind of hard for them to get their minds around it and go, wait, you mean I can weave new fabric? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? How is that possible? So um, usually people are quite terrified when they start it. And I say that the first darn that you do is always ugly. It's like the first pancake. You just have yeah. to get it out of the way. Yes. Yeah, so don't try it on your favorite um, wool jumper where the elbows have um, started to disintegrate. Try it on well, something else. Well, you could. And I'm not going to talk people out of it because if – there are people listening who are anything like me. I am that person who just goes straight to the complex stuff <laughs> um, because, you know, I can't, I can't help myself. I'm like, I'm just going to skip the beginner stage. But um, socks are the best thing that you can possibly practice on because everyone has heaps of socks. Mm. They get hidden in your shoes if you don't want to show anyone. 
And they also wear out because we wear them all the time. So they're like the perfect practice or tea towels as well. Really good to practice on. And who's going to care if you have like an ugly mended tea towel, you know, yes. it's like really low stakes. Yes. I always thought of darning as a layer that you put over the top of um, the the woven fabric where that mesh work is already in place and you're just reinforcing it. Do you have a – is that what darning is or do you – That is one type of darning. Okay. Surface darning, yeah, also known as needle weaving. So you can oh, okay. basically weave a patch on the top and only the edges are secured to the fabric that you're mending or you can integrate – you're weaving into the fabric itself, and there's multiple ways to do that. Okay. So, um, and what would you suggest people start on for something like that? Uh, there's a technique in my book called I've called it or I've called it classic darning, but that's the name that I made up because it has multiple names in the old books, and it can get quite confusing, especially when I was doing the research. I was like, how am I gonna? explain that this particular oh. technique has 10 different names <laughs> yes like, well I'm glad you said classic that's I'm glad that you've applied your own name to it because that's what I would look up if I was if I was sort of searching through your book and it's set or, or a darning book I if something said classic I'd think great that's for me I'm a beginner tell me how I get started so yeah. thank you for organizing it into the <laughs> into the different into the different categories I've I have noticed um, there's been, and we have um, featured it in um, some social media posts and some newsletters in Hands-On Workshop, this fascination for using the Japanese um, borrow stitching for doing the um, repairing of jeans. Would you call that darning where you do that sort of over stitching? It kind of depends. Um, it gets really tricky when we talk about boro and we talk about sashiko, which are very popular right now. Um, in mending on the internet because we you and I can't really do boro which uh, my understanding is that the translation is rags mm -hmm. from the Japanese word for rags or that's an approximation of the translation um, but it's a technique that started many many years ago and it was in specific to a region of Japan and it and it came about because that particular region did not have access to wool and other clothes or other yes. fibers that we would normally have. So so, yes. um, so we can kind of try to emulate it or be inspired by it, but we can't actually do it. And so when people talk about boro stitching, mm -hmm. I kind of, the hairs on the back of my neck kind of go up because I think it's, again, it's being inspired by what they see, but there's not actually a boro stitch or um, a particular way to do it. But I think running stitch is very, very popular. And that's the stitch um, if if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the one that looks like a dotted line, like you might see on the road. Um, and it's just going in and out and you can use that to secure patches. It's also yes. the foundation stitch for classic darning. So, mm. so stitching fabric is not necessarily darning, but, um, but it can be, some of the elements of it can be used for darning. Right. And I guess that, that, um, that running stitch, that in and out stitch is really what, um, when it's used on the Japanese fabrics, is um I guess that is what is now sort of defined, you know, in the in in the world as boro as boro as you pronounced it correctly, stitching where it's just that in and out stitching, and you're often overlaying fabric. It's a way of sort of piecing together fabrics and just adding that extra layer. And I guess the um going over and over again can can reinforce it. But you're right that it's it's um probably not the correct interpretation of of the true boro stitch well I've seen people have arguments on the internet too about <laughs> whether something is boro stitching or not and I'm like people we're like we can't let's not so so I'm not going to get angry if someone uses that word but there but there is no actual like boro stitch there's it's, it's more of an aesthetic than anything else but um yes. there's a there's a concept in improv known as yes and where if someone says something, then instead of rejecting it or going on your own, you you take that concept that they've introduced and then you add something to it. And I really like that idea for mending as well. And that does work for Boro as well, where instead of removing something that's damaged, you just keep adding layers on top of it and making it something much more complex and interesting. And that's my preferred way to mend as well. I don't tend to remove damaged sections unless I really need to. I tend to add more to what I'm mending. 
Mm-hmm. So your your book is Modern Mending, and that's the name of your your business, your website, and your um, and your uh, social media. What would you say is the key difference between traditional and modern? Oh, it's a mindset, really. Yeah, <laughs> um, yes. I, well, I think it depends on who's listening right now. But if you are someone who's listening and you haven't done any mending ever, and the idea that you have in your mind is like um, something that like elderly women would do involving the lace and in a Jane Austen novel, do you think? Pardon? Um, sitting around the fireplace chatting in a Jane Austen novel. Well, you know, that's actually like my favorite way to darn socks is around the fire. <laughs> so, oh, no, I, I, love myself, you know, I, I have a craft group and, and that's what we do. And it, it's interesting because um, some women are, are not so as they just come for the social get together um, and they're my, like my local friends. And then some come with their mending and it's beautiful because they have really, they have really enjoyed it and have said, and some of them are the, are the, um, uh, women who have a mending basket and they do get to stuff and then some just sort of skipped that whole thing and have never got around to it but no I'm I'm not not saying that f- facetiously I I think that process is beautiful and, and I agree with you but it is interesting that that's what we associate like yes. traditional mending with like something that was part of another time when when people had more time yes and also like I think of young girls um, you know, sitting around the fire and doing the women's work kind of thing. Yes. It's not necessarily that, but for but for me, modern um, is two things. It means um, updated to reflect the clothes that we wear now. So not necessarily darning hosiery. <laughs> or um, I can think of quite like you know, if you want to, great. But how many of us actually wear stockings now? Yes. You know, so it's more about um, mending jeans and t-shirts or whatever it is that you wear, you know, the, th- the clothes that we have now, not the clothes of ye olde times. Um, and the other part of it is um, aesthetic. So for me, I love geometric shapes. I love bold colors. I love really clean lines. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the stuff that's been in like Martha Stewart Living Magazine or her craft books, but but the Martha Stewart brand has this way of taking traditional crafts and putting a really beautiful spin on it so that you end up deciding you wanted to do something you never wanted to do before. Yes, like and, I know and you're right. That that is their secret. They do that very, very well. Yes. So that for me, that's the secret of, you know, the whole modern aspect of going, well, quilting has always been around forever, but you never really wanted to do it until you saw how it could be done beautifully. So it's yes. about showing some of those traditional techniques, but also showing techniques that I've kind of invented myself. Um, and also, you know, things that combine those two and going, well, you can make it look however you want. So if you if you are someone who likes a more rustic look, then you can go for that. If you're someone who likes really precise shapes and bold colors, you can go for that, or you can go for a more subtle mend, but you don't have to try to make it invisible anymore. Yes, and I noticed one of the products that you um, sell on your website, which I just thought was fabulous, were these gold, um, and it looked like a paint splodge on a piece of uh, fabric. I, I, I'm afraid I don't know the details of fabric. And that's something that you use to actually make a feature of a stain rather than trying to hide a stain. Right. Or you can embroider around the outline of a stain and celebrate it, you know, make it more pronounced. Or um, I have this fantastic book that adds faces to watercolor splotches. And I apply oh, that same principle to stains and go, well, can I turn, does this look like a dog? Does it look like, um, I don't know, a man sitting on a park bench? Like, what can I turn this into and actually make it more interesting and just roll with it? It's the yes and principle. The, um, what are they called? The raw, those ink blot interpretations? The raw, sh- raw shark. Raw, raw shark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, that's the, the raw shark of the um, stain on your outfit. Um, which I guess brings us to the reason um, we connected in the first place is because you um, discovered the beautiful um, uh, Japanese Nuno Deco adhesive tape and you're interested in exploring that for patching and I was so excited because I think that is just the most fabulous tape and I felt like it hadn't really reached its true potential 
So we use the Nuno deck. Deco fabric tape for decorating things, but you um, have ideas about how you can use it in in different ways. Yeah, I've used it in a few different ways. Um, I just mended a pair of track pants. Oh, nice! That had like twelve holes in them, so I just it was really quick way to mend that. Um, I also used which it is track- handy these days because um, track pants really are the new workwear. <laughs> so they're getting they're getting a lot more they're getting a lot that. more mileage and they're probably they're probably going to be seen on your Skype and your Zoom calls more than they used to. Well, hopefully not. We'll keep it, <laughs> keep it above the belt. But um, but no, I do love them and I don't want to have to throw them out. And I think that's one of the things that people always are surprised about when they see my work that I will I will mend four hundred dollar linen dresses made ethically in Australia. And I will also mend tea towels and underpants and socks and track pants. Like I don't care. I will also mend fast fashion. Like I think if it already exists, we need to keep it going. Yes. So I'm an equal opportunity mender. Yes. No, um, great thinking. I have a very um, clear memory of um, my mother who wasn't um, wasn't sort of much of a sewer. Look, she was a sewer because she was part of the generation where you just did that, but she didn't love it. I mean, she, I was sort of in the generation where before that huge um, growth in cheap production of clothing, um, where it was, it was much, and especially in Australia, it was much more expensive to buy clothes. But I do remember, you know, my favourite ever dress as a kid um, that probably wasn't that expensive, but it was, um, do you remember shirt dresses? No, uh, it was the. Um, it's like an, a, a way of um, uh, elasticizing. Uh, uh, what's gosh? I should know this technique, and I just don't know the name. Um, not embroidery. Um, what's that type of? Oh, um, sorry. It was a way of sort of um, scrunching up fabric, but using threads of elastic through it. Oh, smocking. Sm- yep. Yeah, sorry. Smocking. Forgot that word. It was like smocking, but using a, a elastic and it was used often for little girls dresses as the kind of stretchy bit around the top half of the outfit. So you'd have the smocking sort of wrapped around the bodice and then it would just, you just have the same fabric just as the skirt. So it was actually really uh, on, on machines so these are sort of mass manufactured it was an easy way of doing smocking but with thin elastic and it was great for sort of little girls dresses and it was just a thing it was like every little girl seemed to have one of those um I think they were called shirt dresses and they had little straps but anyway my favorite dress of all time I remember getting a rip in it from climbing a tree and I was so upset about it because I absolutely adored that dress and my mum made a flower from bias binding attached it to the hole but then put a few around the rim of the skirt and I remember thinking wow she's just turned that into the most special most beautiful dress I've ever had so it was it was the same thing it was making it really special and different from the repair rather than the repair being covered up yes and also I just want to put it out there like I love mending and I love what I do, but I don't, I don't always love the process of mending or sometimes I love parts of it, but I'm, I'm the type of person who cooks to eat. I like to eat really good food. I don't necessarily love cooking, but I love eating really good food. So I will cook to eat. And it's the same kind of thing with mending. Some parts of it I really love, but it's usually worth it because the finished product, it, I do have a lot of those aha moments, like your dress that you're talking about, where you go, oh my gosh, this is now my favorite pair of pants ever, or my favorite dress. Like, how did I ever take so long to actually get this done, you know? So it, so the transformation um, can be really quite amazing, or even a favorite pair of socks that you darned, you know? And it And the thing is, like, I'm a professional mender, and I've been doing this a long time, but I still get surprised every time. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so good. It's my favorite. But there's a, sometimes there's a period of terror that happens before that, where I'm like, oh, am I going to ruin this? Is this, is this like the worst thing I've ever done? I'm going to, you know, what am I doing? This is terrible, especially if I'm mending for someone else. And then once I get past that, then I get to the favorite thing stage. But but I just want to, I'm saying this is a matter of motivation, not discouragement, to let people know that if you start 
mending or you're like, oh, that sounds like fun. Maybe I'll try darning. And you don't immediately love it. Like, that's okay. You don't have to love every part of it, but it's usually worth it for the end result. Do you think that's just mimics the creative journey? There's always that trough where things fall apart. It all gets a bit ugly. You're ready to walk away. But if you keep going, there's a point where you can piece it together. Do you think that 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 the mending journey is the, is is part of that creative process? Totally. I also think that I'm in a unique situation because now I'm known for my mending and I post it a lot on Instagram. And so there's that extra fear factor for me. Pressure. Sure. Like, oh, yes. And it's like, <laughs> oh, this is not good enough. Um, but I've read something recently that um, someone that I follow on Instagram was saying, look, not everything has to be perfect. You don't have to keep setting the bar higher for yourself every time yes. because it creates its own kind of madness. And it's OK to have little things or like not quite great things, but get it done. I'm a big fan of just getting stuff done and getting it out of the mending pile. So not everything has to be a work of art. OK. OK. Well, that's good to know. Um, so for the. For the beginners, um, what do you suggest they start with? Socks. Darn okay. your socks. Okay. But that still requires a little bit, I guess, looking at some of your um, um, tips and techniques in your book and looking at your website to learn the basics of getting started. Yeah, definitely in my book. There are, um, there are videos on YouTube and there are some menders who have posted tutorials on their Instagram accounts but the quality is really, it really varies. Um, and some of the things that are out there, I wouldn't necessarily recommend. It can be a bit hit and miss. So don't uh, just start like Googling, you know, how to darn socks, because you're going to find a lot of things that don't necessarily apply. But um, there are, I think, it's at least 20 pages of darning instructions. But now the second edition of my book is coming out next month. And I'm pretty sure it's at least... 30 pages of darning instructions, all different types. So like oh, more than you probably want to know. Right. <laughs> okay, okay. So, but, but start small. And you think socks just because it gives you that sense of achievement or because it's just something practical you can reuse? Oh, there's so many reasons. Um, so pretty much everyone has socks unless you're someone who wears Birkenstocks all the time and you yep. like to have fresh air on your toes. Yep. Um, so we've all got socks. We all wear through them. And even um, I noticed like in my house, for example, I always wear out the heels of my socks yes. and my husband wears out the toes. Yes. So Isn't that funny. everyone has different wear patterns. So even if you don't have, even if you are a magic wizard who doesn't wear out your socks, which congratulations, by the way, you will probably have someone in your house or your community mm. who does have socks. So that so they get worn and used a lot and they get worn out a lot. And you also wash them a lot. So yes. if you press yes, on darning, you can see like there's certain tips and tricks that I give to make sure your darn isn't too tight or it doesn't shrink in the wash more than you want it to. So it's a really good testing ground to to see how those kind of things hold up out oh, over okay. time and go, is this actually durable? What do I need to do to make this stronger next time? But in the case of my husband, I taught him how to darn his own socks because I'm a very firm believer in that everyone should darn their own socks. Yes. Unless you've got a medical reason why you can't do it, which is, which is fine. But uh, men and definitely you need to should... submit that to you need to submit that to Erin for her to actually approve the medical certificate. No, 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 no. But some people might have mobility issues or they yes. might have, you know, they might have um difficulty seeing or motor coordination but but for the people who don't you have no excuse yep. to not darn your own socks so I taught my husband how to do it and I think the big thing he was surprised by was how um how well it's held up and how you can't feel it at all like when you darn that's a big surprise it's so integrated into the fabric that you actually can't feel the darn it feels just like sock Right. Um, and he's washed it so many times since he's darned that sock and it looks amazing. And he's always shocked. Like, wow, I, you know, my first try was actually a really durable mend that's held up and the sock doesn't have any more damage. So it's, it's kind of a fun way to experiment. Okay. I will start with the darning. And in fact, I did have a beautiful pair of um, fine wool socks 
um, my husband uh, bought for me in Japan and I love them so much and I have had that moment of thinking, oh gosh, the heels are wearing out. What, what am I going to do? I just don't. And, and also they were not an inexpensive item, um, but they are, you know, they're beautiful and the colours are beautiful. And now I know that is on my, uh, that is the project that I need to tackle because now I will know who to follow, which is, which is great. Um, Erin, that um, just one thing with your apart from reading through your books, um, you do run workshops and courses, but um, they also seem to be incredibly popular. Can you tell me when you do a, a workshop, do you do it live, and how long does it go for? Well, at the moment, or I should say, last year, I was running six week courses, so six separate sessions once a week, um, and those and that were was live, live with a group. Yes, those were live. And I did actually ask the group, would you have purchased this course if it was pre-recorded instead? And most people said no. They said because that peer pressure or having that place to be and having to show up made a difference in actually getting it done. So some people who come to my courses already know how to mend or already know how to do a lot of the techniques, but it's more about actually creating that time and space to do it. You don't have to attend a course to do that. It might be something like your crafting circle that you're talking about. Um, and it can be virtual as well. Like, you know, if you can't get together because of COVID, it could be something where you just all set a certain time to show up on Zoom yes. and just get together and mend and talk through it and help each other. You know, there's something about that having to show up and, and making, dedicating the time and space for it to actually get stuff done. Yes. And when you're actually doing that live, did you, does everybody show their pieces and just ask questions that way? Or do you, uh, are you there to, to teach a technique in each, each um, session of the course? It's both. So in the, I used to teach my um, course in person in the, in the before times. Yes. And on the first night, everyone used to bring their mending piles and I would go through them so while people were stitching, I would go through the mending piles one by one and kind of give a quick assessment and say, you know, bring this back on darning night or patching night or here's what you need to know about this. We can't do that with Zoom because it would take hours. So what I've done instead is have students submit before photos of the clothes that need mending and then I show them on screen and I have this fancy computer that has a touch screen and so I actually draw on the photos. Oh, wow. In class and everyone gets to watch it. So it's, it's, they have said that's their favorite part of the class is actually getting that advice on specific things. Cause I can teach you darning and patching and all of that. But what if you have something that actually needs like very, it's a very specific problem, you know, and yes. every mend is completely unique. Every bit of damage is unique in some way. So, um, so sometimes that can be really valuable to have someone just talk you through it and say, here's exactly where you stitch this bit and here's how you put it together. So it's, um, in some ways I was anxious about migrating my course to online, but in a lot of ways it's actually turned out to be even better than the original course because of the amazing technological capabilities that we've got now. That sounds like a fantastic idea. I know I really like that. Um, oh, look, that's good. And that's really exciting to, to see that it really, um, has become so popular and that that you have really sort of helped, you know, encourage that interest in it. I think it's terrific. And as um, you have said earlier, the there are such strong um, reasons to be, environmental reasons really, to be reusing and recycling and just repurposing things. And, but finding um, joy in that process too is, is really wonderful. I think it should not be understated the endorphins that you get from finishing a repair. And I'm I'm all about the quick wins. So yes, there are yeah. like, sometimes there are um, proper, I'm using air quotes, you can't see me. Yes, but sometimes no, there are like proper ways to do things. And there's yeah. like, you know, things that'll be more durable and long lasting. But uh, like, I've had people say to me like, oh, I stapled a pair of pants when the hem came down. And they think I'm going to I don't know, it's like confession time or something. And like, I'm a priest and they're telling me that they stapled or taped their pants. And I say, <laughs> that is fine. Like, at least you did something about it. You know, I don't care how you did it. As well, long I've, as it I've been, I, I have been a fan of gaffer taping hems for, oh gosh, years. 
Really? Sure, why not? <laughs> I mean, you know, like, I really, I'm not going to judge, you know, the fact that you did something. There, the more you learn, though, then you can go back to those old men's and you can redo them. Most men's can be redone once you've actually learned different techniques and skills. So, so just getting it out of the mending pile or out of landfill is a win. Um, and so, yeah, I'm definitely all about the quick ones though. And I have to make sure that when I've got mending commissions, cause like the last mending commission I did took me a week, like a solid week, like full time to get it done. It was pretty epic. Wow. And so I have to make sure that sometimes I, you know, I, that I add the five minute men's in between in the queue so that I don't get discouraged. And I remember like how good it feels to finish. Yes, I think you're right. And and I think that can be applied to sort of many aspects of life. If you can do the small little things that give you a, give you that buzz and keep the motivation going, then it, it, uh, helps you sort of work on the bigger projects. But as you said, um, it, it's interesting that you as the professional mentor said, you know, sometimes it just feels like it's it, it it's hard work, just sort of pushing your way through and sort of resolving, you know, resolving the problem. So that's, that's motivation in itself. If somebody who absolutely loves mending and has um, built a whole sort of following around it still, has moments where you struggle with it, then that's um that's inspiration for us all. Yes. The other thing I would add to that, um, I have a Facebook group that is called Modern Mending Club, and it's free. Anyone can join. We've got right. we're close to twenty five hundred people from around oh, the world. Fantastic. I've joined, but I think that is super motivational because people have been sharing their stories, mm -hmm. and they've been saying this took me this long, and it was. It was really difficult, but I finished. And there's so much encouragement there. And there's people from all and um, parts of the spectrum, from people who've never mended and have no idea where to start, to people who are actually professional repair people and everything in between. And so it's just really, really nice when people share the honest truth about this was really fun to do, this wasn't, or it was totally worth it, or I completely stuffed this up and here's what I learned and then I redid it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Instead of it just being a brag club. Yes. Yes. Because there's, I can't tell you how many times students have been in my class and they've said, oh, I, I tried to do this thing that I saw on Pinterest or I saw on Instagram. And I'm like, oh no, you pick like the hardest thing to try first, but they make it look so easy and they don't tell you. <laughs> you think, that, like, and that's why it's on Pinterest and Instagram. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, don't, no, 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 no. That's, it's not totally honest. So yeah, I try to. I try to add that into my descriptions too and say, this is, this is what I did. This is how long it took me. Um, these are the different things that I did or I learned because I think it's better to be honest about it. I think that that's my particular feeling is that it's better to be honest about it. You're going to bring more people along that way yes. than to just go, wait, look at this amazing thing I did. Now pay me to teach you how to do it. It's like, mm. Yes, no. because uh, you're right, and people won't stick with it. But um, they can, uh, to find out more about you, people can um, jump onto modernmending.com. They can join your Facebook group, um, pick up the book, and you said your new book is coming out uh, next month, which is terrific. Yes, it is the same book, but it has, I think, 35 more pages. Technically, okay. it's 32 physical pages that we added and I created them during lockdown too in Melbourne. But um, we did some some creative reorganizing of the design of the book. I actually removed things that I thought were unnecessary so that we could fit in more tutorials. So oh, it's, okay, great. Yes, yeah, so Terrific. it's a very fat, heavy book now. <laughs> it's going to be really expensive <laughs> to ship, but um, but it has almost everything I know in there. So. Okay, that sounds terrific. But your um, courses have sold out and uh, do you have plans for another round? Definitely. There will be a few rounds this year. Um, we use the book as my textbook. So I, I'm holding off on the next round of courses until the new edition comes out so that I can make sure that everyone who attends the course actually has that textbook as a resource because otherwise it's just it's a little bit hard like if you don't um remember exactly what I said during the course or you you need to know a little bit more information you've got that as a backup so yes they will be starting up again probably in March okay terrific and um I look forward to seeing some of your photos of how you've used the Nuno Deco tape for their track pants 
There's one coming up today. Great. Okay. Well, I'll make sure I share that on um, our website too. But Erin um, Lewis Fitzgerald, uh, e ELF, <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time and for really giving lots of really valuable ideas and uh, inspiration for us getting started on our um, on our mending journey. Thank you so much.